tonight confirmed charges against five former World Junior hockey players as the case is expected to go to court on Monday. One count each of sexual assault. The case is going to come down to consent. With one player facing an extra charge. Clashing over Alberta's restrictions on transgender rights for young people. An all-out ideological war. Also, a countrywide checkup on cardiac arrest with nearly half of patients under 65. I had collapsed. Woke up in the hospital in ICU. You used to call me on my cell phone. Plus, the day the music stopped, TikTok pulls popular artists from the platform. And striking a chord with salvaged wood. It's a really cool thing to have something that's already lived 100 plus years. The guitar maker letting history play an instrumental role. CTV National News with Omar Sachedina. Good evening, everyone. Preparations are well underway for the NHL's All-Star Weekend in Toronto, celebrating the best of a sport Canadians know and love. But casting a shadow over those events are accusations against five current and former players in the league whose sexual assault charges were confirmed in a legal document obtained today, which also contains an additional charge. CTV's Heather Wright explains. Charges against five former members of Canada's World Junior Hockey team have officially been filed in a London, Ontario courtroom. Each player faces one count of sexual assault, while New Jersey Devils centre Michael McLeod faces that charge plus an additional charge of being party to the offence. It seems there might be two occurrences within the evening. One where he may be a principal, the person that actually engages in the sexual assault, and then two, a second occurrence, where he may be aiding or abetting, enabling others to commit a sexual act. The five players who are all on leave from their respective professional teams are accused of sexually assaulting a young woman in a hotel room following a Hockey Canada gala in 2018. A case that was closed by the London Police Service that year, but reopened in 2022 following outrage that a lawsuit filed by the alleged victim was quietly settled by Hockey Canada. The charging document shows the five accused, Carter Hart, Alex Formentin, Cal Foote, Dylan Dubé and Michael McLeod all surrender to London police between January 26th and January 30th and have been released. Lawyers for the players all say their clients are innocent and plan to vigorously fight these charges, none of which has been tested or proven in court. While this court process is expected to take months, perhaps more than a year, if convicted, these crimes carry sentences of up to 10 years in prison. These aren't the types of cases that typically result in a non-custodial sentence. This is the kind of thing, if it's found to be sexual assault, that you would go to jail for. Police in London, Ontario will hold a news conference on Monday to provide more information about these charges, while lawyers for the five players will be in court that same day for a first appearance. Omar. All right, Heather, thank you. A coroner's inquest into the police shooting of a Toronto teenager over a decade ago has found it was a homicide. Former Constable James Forsillo, who shot 18-year-old Sammy Atim in 2013, was convicted of attempted murder. Today, the jury at the inquest made 63 recommendations for all police services in Ontario, including compulsory peer intervention training, mental health supports for officers and families of victims, and mandating body-worn cameras for frontline officers. Yatim was holding a knife on an empty streetcar when he was struck by two separate volleys of shots. There is another showdown brewing between the federal government and Alberta's premier, and this time it has to do with Danielle Smith's proposed restrictions on transgender youth, expected to be implemented by the end of the year. Here's CTV's Annie Bergeron-Oliver. My fellow Albertans... Danielle Smith is the latest Conservative Premier to weigh into gender politics, introducing sweeping changes to gender-affirming care. We want to make sure that uh, kids know the consequences that it's going to have on their life 
and that they're mature enough to be able to make those decisions and live with the consequences. And, and they're adult decisions, so we want to make sure that certain decisions are made as adults. Today, Smith officially unveiled a 10-point policy that includes a ban on top and bottom surgery for all children 17 and under and hormonal treatment and puberty blockers for anyone 15 and under. A requirement for Alberta parents to give permission before students 15 and under can change their name or pronoun at school. And an obligation for parents to opt in to all classes about sex education, orientation and gender identity. We're aiming to be supportive of children's rights. We, we want to make sure that children do not prematurely make decisions. Alberta's new policy goes a step further than New Brunswick and Saskatchewan, who both require parental consent before schools can use a student's preferred pronoun and name. Advocates say today's changes will have a long-term impact. This policy will likely force trans kids to come out at home before they're ready, which may lead to those kids being rejected by their parents and cast out of those homes. After years of waiting and wishing, Albertan Luce Evans got his top surgery done at 17. He believes other trans kids should have that same choice. If I didn't have the ability to like transition, I don't think I'd be around right now. When we were able to get the surgery for him, the top surgery, it was just night and day. Yeah. Like, he was... I was me. Yes. <laughs> the federal health minister says he disagrees with Alberta's policy and plans to meet with his provincial counterpart soon. I think it's extremely dangerous to, uh, to engage in this kind of thing, which is, I, I think, playing politics. Um, when you're talking about children's lives. The changes have yet to take effect. And while Smith says she's confident her policy is constitutional, at least two groups, Omar, have already said they're considering legal action. All right, Annie, thank you. And Canada's health minister introduced legislation today to postpone the government's planned expansion of assisted dying until 2027. There's a moral imperative for us to get the systems ready. So by setting out a timeline of three years, it's an indication that the systems need to move towards readiness. The extension comes after Ottawa revealed this week it would not be able to meet the March deadline to expand eligibility to those suffering solely from a mental illness. When it comes to cardiac arrest, every second counts. CTV's Adrian Gobriel on a troubling new snapshot and the critical solutions. A concerning Canada-wide trend. And I felt fluttering in my chest. The Heart and Stroke Foundation found that approximately 60,000 out-of-hospital cardiac arrests are happening in Canada each year. Only 1 in 10 people will survive when their heart suddenly stops outside of a medical facility. Numbers much higher than previously estimated. Patients are also getting younger. Nearly half of all cardiac arrests are happening to people under the age of 65. I don't fit the profile of what someone thinks of when they think heart problems. Lauren Ross was just 28 years old when she went into cardiac arrest while out for a jog. I remember looking at my Fitbit to check my heart rate, I, but I remember thinking, I'm going to turn around and go home. Um, I don't remember anything from that point on. The fast action of complete strangers saved her life. Two Molly Maid employees were driving by at the time of my arrest and they stopped and one started CPR. If there was no bystander intervention, bystander CPR, I wouldn't be allowed to tell you this story today. Ross's story underscores the importance of everyone learning simple CPR techniques or knowing where a defibrillator is located inside a building. You don't need to take a course in order to recognize that you're, somebody's in cardiac arrest. Call 911, shout for an AED and push hard and fast. She was on the way to the hospital, but she didn't, she didn't make it. Far too many Canadians simply don't survive the medical emergency. Sarah Lush's sister Robin had just lost her husband to cancer. Days later, the 40-year-old widow and mother went into cardiac arrest while at home by herself. Our family is peppered with um, different kinds of heart issues that we never really looked into because it was a never us moment. Until it was. Robin leaves behind a 14-year-old son. On average, one person in this country suffers a cardiac arrest every nine minutes. Omar. All right, Adrian, thank you. And there is more sobering health data tonight on the global burden of cancer. The World Health Organization is now projecting one in five people 
will develop cancer in their lifetime. And by 2050, there will be more than 35 million new cancer cases, a 77% increase from the estimated 20 million cases in 2022. The leading forms of cancer are lung, breast, colorectal, prostate, and stomach. The head of Canada's intelligence agency defended the approach to secrecy today at a federal inquiry into foreign meddling in Canadian politics. CTV's Jeremy Charon reports. A push for as much transparency as possible. That was the focus as the director of Canada's spy agency testified today at the inquiry into foreign election interference. In order to build their resilience and, and, and uh, reassure Canadians, especially about the uh, electoral processes, that there would be a need to have uh, more information in the public domain. David Vigneault indicated the government has come up with procedures to provide summaries and edited versions of secret documents to assist the inquiry in its work. But some human rights groups already have concerns about the process. I lost my face and I'm not optimistic. A group advocating for China's minority Uyghurs here in Canada has backed out of the inquiry over concerns about three individuals with alleged ties to China being granted standing. They should be answering questions, not examining the witnesses. And we decided that the victims of uh, foreign interference and alleged perpetrators seem to be misplaced. This preliminary round of hearings setting the stage for March, when the inquiry will address alleged interference in the 2019 and 2021 elections by countries like China, India and Russia. But this former CSIS director says Canada's National Security Services could be more transparent. I think another area that's worth thinking about is our allies, our close allies, are much, much more open than we are. They really protect their core secrets, but the Brits, the Yanks, the Australians tend to be much more open than Canada is. Tomorrow, the inquiry will hear from Public Safety Minister Dominic LeBlanc before pausing until the next round of hearings. Omar? All right, Jeremy, thank you. The White House took an unprecedented step today to stem surging violence against Palestinians in the West Bank. It is very much to send the message that we think more needs to be done by the government of Israel. U.S. President Joe Biden imposed financial sanctions on four Israeli settlers accused of attacking Palestinians and peace activists in the occupied territory. Israel's prime minister blasted the move. European Union leaders have unanimously approved a 50 billion euro aid package for Ukraine. This is a clear signal that Ukraine will withstand and that Europe will with stand. The agreement was announced today at a summit in Brussels and comes after weeks of negotiations with the lone holdout, Hungary, whose leader, Viktor Orban, a Putin ally, previously vetoed the aid package. The EU's president says today's deal locks in steadfast, long-term and predictable funding for Ukraine. Meanwhile, outside those meetings in Brussels, chaos. Hundreds of angry farmers descended on the European Parliament demanding relief from rising prices and bureaucracy. Police used tear gas and water cannons on the protesters who set fires and blocked roads. There is also a battle rocking the music world tonight. The fight is between a company that owns some of the biggest record labels in the industry and TikTok, which has removed music by superstars such as Taylor Swift and Canada's The Weeknd. CTV's Joy Malvin on why the titans are clashing. Well, this happened. It's not exactly the day the music died, but suddenly TikTok users found songs from some of their favorite artists were missing. The Chinese-owned social media app carried a new message. This sound isn't available because of copyright violation. Fans were outraged. Wake up! It's the first of the... I'm never going to have a good month again. The takedown came after Universal, that owns one-third of the world's music, made good on its threat, pulling permission to use the music on TikTok after a nasty contract fight over money and royalties. This does look like a war between TikTok and Universal, given the language that each party has been uh, throwing back and forth. In an open letter, Universal accused TikTok of bullying and not paying fair value for the music. TikTok charged Universal with putting their own greed above the interest of their artist and songwriters. With its short video clips, TikTok has revitalized classics. Megastars have become soundtracks to lip sync videos and viral dance challenges. TikTok fame is also a great promotional platform for emerging artists. 
Canadian musician Carl Wolf owns his own material, but used to be with Universal. As I was looking at TikTok today, and just looking at all my catalog, all my old songs with Universal, they aren't there anymore. It's not just a dispute over money. Universal accuses TikTok of trying it's to AI flood its platform with AI-generated music. I get it right there. There's concern that platforms like TikTok may circumvent licensing agreements entirely by using artificial intelligence to come up with innocuous music that has no copyright claimed on it whatsoever. Therefore, they don't have to pay anything for it. The last time there was a standoff like this was in 2008 when Warner pulled its music videos from YouTube. That dispute lasted nine months, Omar. All right, Joy, thanks. Coming up, the sorrow after the storm. I feel like I've lost the first 60 years of my life. The lingering devastation more than a year after Hurricane Fiona. Plus, race car driver Lewis Hamilton shifts gears. The terrifying impact of one of the most powerful and destructive storms in Canadian history is still being felt in Atlantic Canada, almost a year and a half after it slammed the region. As CTV's Garrett Berry shows us in a small town in southwestern Newfoundland, even as people try to push forward, there are reminders of the past. The storm ravaged this town, houses, lives pushed into the ocean. Much of it is now still being found. Ocean Cleanup Group Clean Harbor Initiative is back in Port of Basques this week. They've been here several times since Fiona hit. It gets pretty emotional when you're hauling up, like, especially pieces of headstones and stuff like that. It's like this is someone's family member that's probably not there anymore. If you look closely in this town, you'll see little reminders of what's been lost. This white picket fence is one example, the biggest indication that there was a whole house here. Around 60 more are about to come down. The ones inside what's called the high impact zone, areas that are at high risk of water damage. Homeowners will be bought out by the provincial government. Well, here we are two years later, and more homes are going down, and more families, and more neighbors are going to be gone. Peggy Savory knows what it's like to lose almost everything. Her blue house was in that iconic picture seen around the world before it collapsed into the storm. It's not the things but I feel like I've lost the first 60 years of my life and now I have to start over for whatever years I have left, if that makes sense. She says losing a house is traumatic and she feels compassion for the others in town who are losing their homes now. Garrett Perry, CTV News, Port of Basques. Still ahead, the ultimate claw machine, rescuing the trapped toddler who took matters into his own hands. Today is the start of Black History Month, a time to rediscover the rich roots and celebrate the contributions of black Canadians. Here's CTV's Sarah Plowman on the powerful art that reflects the stories of pioneers of African heritage. At the Beaverbrook Art Gallery, people bounced into Black History Month. Inside, a nod to Willie O'Ree, the Fredericton-born hockey legend, the first black man to play in the NHL. Downstairs, the first of a series of conversations led by black artists. Darlene Strong paints about her heritage and other African Nova Scotians. For me, it's important to be here and be the voice of the slaves and the relatives that came in that had no voice that were not permitted to speak. Across the region, stories are being shared, like that of William Hall who was the, the first Nova Scotian, the first black man of color to be honored with uh, the Victoria Cross. He's a hero. When we talk about our veterans and the bravery, William Hall should be in that conversation, much like the Black Battalion. And New Brunswick's A.B. Walker, the first Canadian-born black lawyer. The minute you come in here, all of a sudden your eyes are open to the facts and to the real struggles that went on by all people. It's just that we know and feel that we struggled too long. The aim is to educate, but also inspire. So there would always be odds that you may need to overcome, but what is important is that you can do it. Determination demonstrated through example. That you can find black creative excellence across every single artistic discipline. And this month, people here intend to showcase that talent. Sarah Plowman, CTV News, Fredericton. One of the world's best race car drivers is changing gears.
Seven-time Formula One champion Lewis Hamilton is leaving the Mercedes team he's been part of for 11 years to move to Ferrari. The 39-year-old British racer activated a release clause in the two-year contract he signed with Mercedes last summer. Ferrari says Hamilton will begin driving for them in 2025. And a three-year-old boy in Australia says he will never do it again after being rescued by police at a shopping mall. Glass. Little Ethan here got stuck inside a Hello Kitty plush toy claw machine after climbing through the dispenser to claim his prize. His father told him to stay back, cover his eyes, and police smashed the glass to get him out. That is one determined kid. After the break, the Montreal artisan crafting musical works of art. We leave you tonight with a man whose passion is making instruments with materials that have stories of their own. Here's CTV's Genevieve Beauchemin. With its seductive twang and howling distortions, playing the electric guitar is the stuff of many a fantasy. But to Nick DeLille, the guitar itself is the thing. I think since the invention of the electric guitar, it's been like, you know, kids' kids' dreams to, to become a rock star or whatever. Uh, I just sort of took a bit of a detour and was like, oh, I just want to make the things. Uh, I love um, that. Yeah. <laughs> Nick's hands shape instruments that are works of art with a history. So this one uh, actually belongs to a jazz musician in Baltimore. I love to blend the acoustic and the electric world. Uh, and this instrument right here does a fantastic job. Nick's hands shape instruments that are works of art with a history. It works in an old garment factory that is now a co-op of guitar makers, often using local material. For some models, he repurposes a variety of old wood. And the canvas, as you were saying, it has history, right? Yeah. Why is that important? I just think it's, uh, it's a really cool thing to, to have something that's already lived 100 plus years uh, as, as whatever, uh, and then take it, give it a new life as a musical instrument that's going to then go on to tell its own new stories. The Maplewood floor of Boston's Symphony Hall had been the stage of concerts for a hundred years when it was torn up during renovations. Nick repurposed a plank or two into an electric guitar. So they had been refinished uh, God knows how many times, but you could see all of the layers of lacquer and there was all the pock marks from cello and double bass end pins. It's now been nearly 15 years since Nick founded Island Instruments, reusing resources, wood from his old apartment building, sinker wood from the bottom of the Panama Canal. He makes about 15 guitars a year, much of it sold through word of mouth, giving old wood an electric vibe now resonating in many parts of the world. Geneviève Bosch, my CTV News, Montreal. Beautiful. And that's a snapshot of this Thursday. Heather is here tomorrow for all of us at CTV National News. Thank you for watching and good night.